Hello, everybody. Um, this is Kim Owens with the Down Syndrome Association of Greater Richmond, and I'm glad to have you here tonight. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about special needs trusts and ABLE, and so we're delighted to have Tia Marcelli tonight to uh, give us an overview. She's from the Ark of Northern Virginia, where she manages the trust department, and she's also the parent of two adults with disabilities. She has um, interacted with the Down Syndrome Association many times over the years, and we're glad to have her here tonight for this webinar. So she's gonna introduce herself a little bit more and um, run the presentation. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Kim. I, this is, I wanted to, first I was gonna brag about my daughter on the first slide, Karen. So my colleague Karen is running the slides. That's my older daughter, Sheridan, um, a couple of years ago, whenever she was still riding and COVID wasn't a thing. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about special needs trusts and ABLE, and thank you for the invitation to present, Kim. Next slide, Karen. That's me um, when our offices were actually open. Uh, as Kim mentioned, I'm the mother of two young adult women with disabilities. They both have Down syndrome as their primary diagnosis, and then uh, other diagnoses. One of them is going into surgery tomorrow with ear issues. So... Life is good. Um, we're all healthy, which I think is important. So they're 21 and 27. My 21 year old is still in school in a vocational program in Fairfax County Public School. She's actually at a work site at, at Burlington uh, during the day. And then Sheridan, my older daughter is at a day program. She was working, she's not working right now. And we're looking to get both of them jobs. And I've been at the ARC since September of 2006 and in the position as trust director since August of 2009 when the position was created. Next slide. So who are we and what is the ARC? The ARC is a nonprofit that has a mission statement to protect, promote and protect the human rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and actively support their full inclusion and participation in the community throughout their lifetimes. We're one of about 600 plus chapters throughout the United States. We'll be celebrating our 60th anniversary next year on March 21st, so three times chromosome 21. And um, we're part of the, the largest nonprofit organization worldwide that supports people with IDD. We receive our funding through some direct services, but also through membership, fundraising events, and grants. Thank you. Next slide. We have, um, there are 11 chapters in Maryland, 24 chapters in Virginia, and one ARC chapter in Washington, D.C. And we have over 20 years experience in setting up or establishing and managing special needs trusts in this region. So even though we're based in Northern Virginia, we serve the entire Commonwealth of Virginia, the state of Maryland, and the District of Columbia. We also have trusts in 11 other states. It's not our intent to go national. We do focus on Virginia, Maryland, and DC, but when our clients move, then we can continue providing services for them. Next. Next slide, Karen. Thank you. Oop. This is a part of the trust team. That picture, these pictures were taken pre-COVID. So the trust team has, instead of four people, there are seven staff working with the trust disbursements, establishing trusts, answering, answering questions, troubleshooting, et cetera. We function as the manager of the Special Needs Trust Program, and I'll talk more specifically about what a trust is. And we work with Key Bank as the financial institution that is our trustee. So we have a legal doc, binding document that connects Key Bank and the Ark of Northern Virginia. And then the foundation of the Ark of Northern Virginia is a separate nonprofit that oversees the endowment as well as the Special Needs Trust Program. And it's made up of parents of kids with disabilities, as well as people that don't have children with disabilities, 
a retired banker, a retired millionaire, a retired person at the CIA, don't know what he does, never ask him, financial advisor and attorney and our executive director. Next slide. So tonight we're going to talk about special needs trusts, how our trust program works, the disbursement process, special needs trust fees, and ABLE accounts. And just so you know, we'll take a five minute break at eight o'clock. So if you're sitting there and say, I can't, I can't leave the, the screen at eight o'clock, we'll give you five minutes to get up and run around. And then I also forgot to mention when your questions arise, put them in the Q and A at the bottom of your screen, not in the chat, because if you put them in the chat, Karen, my colleague's gonna ask you to move them over to the Q and A. And we ask you to do that because at the end, um, Karen will save the Q and A and go back and, and pull the transcript as well. And then we put together an FAQ, a frequently asked question, and that will get sent out to you next week. This week, you'll be able to get a, a copy of the recording and the slides. I'll repeat that. You'll get a copy of the webinar, a, a link to it, as well as the slides that you're looking at now. And then next week, when Karen has the FAQ done, she'll send that out to everyone that RSVP'd as well. Next slide. So today's questions, or this evening's questions, that we'll answer are, how can I leave money for my child without jeopardizing benefits? Why is it important to move money into a special needs trust? How does a special needs trust or SNT work? It's also called a SNIT among attorneys. How does one disperse from a special needs trust? Why is our program unique? And do I need both a special needs trust and ABLE account? Next slide. So what is a special needs trust? Here's your definition. It's a legal vehicle that provides benefit to and protects the assets of a person with disabilities and still allows that person to qualify for and receive government benefits. So it's a legal document. It's, and it is for the benefit of the individual with, in, uh, with disabilities. So the money has to be at arm's length in order for um, it to not count as an asset or resource. Next slide. Who's eligible for a special needs trust? Anyone with a physical, mental, and or developmental disability as defined by the Social Security Act. And that's right off of Social Security Administration's website. So it's a broad definition of uh, who is eligible for a special needs trust. Next slide. So why do people establish special needs trusts? Well, the primary reason is to protect government benefits. And government benefits, that means Medicaid, a Medicaid waiver, supplemental security income, housing grants or food stamps, anything that the government provides, any benefit that the government is providing to a person that is based on their income. So the government's, if somebody might apply for Medicaid because they don't have any other health insurance, well, the government wants to know if the person has any assets and resources in their name. Do they have any retirement accounts or bank accounts or a Rolex watch collection or because if they have their own assets, then the government's going to say, spend those down to under $2,000 and reapply for benefits. And so by establishing a trust, you can leave your child things from your will, right? You have a last will and testament and you say, for example, I said 50% of my estate goes to Sky's special needs trust and 50% of my estate goes to Sheridan Special Needs Trust, using the legal terminology, of course, um, which we provide. And that way, it's not counted as their money, and it doesn't ever jeopardize that $2,000 asset limit. Another reason why people establish trusts is to help the individual with disabilities with their money management and long-term financial planning. So maybe somebody doesn't have Medicaid, but they have Medicare, 
and Social Security Disability Insurance, which are both entitlements for a person with disabilities, and that they can have a fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars in their name, and still maintain their Medicare and their Social Security disability. But the parent knows <clears throat> if I give my child. Five thousand, fifty thousand, five hundred thousand dollars. They're going to spend it, or someone's going to spend it for them, in a very quick, on a very quick timeline. And so they establish a special needs trust and direct their assets, investment accounts, or their estate, or an insurance policy, to the special needs trust. And the third reason is to promote the dignity, comfort, and happiness of the person with disabilities. So I get, always give this example when I, one of the first presentations I did at the ARC Montgomery County was to elderly parents of adults with the ARC of Montgomery County living in their group homes or supported apartments or whatever the housing situation was. And one of the parents said, well, why do I even need a trust? The ARC is, you know, the government's paying for everything. They have somewhere to live. They have Medicaid. They have this, that, and the other thing. And I ask, how many of you visit your children in the group home? And everybody raised their hands. And I said, what do you do? Oh, we go out to dinner every Friday night. Oh, we go to church and then we go to brunch on Sundays. We go to bowling on Thursdays and swimming on Saturdays. And I said, who's paying for that? And they, well, we are, we are, of course we are. And I said, so when you're dead, let's be real here. When you're gone, when you're dead, who's going to be paying for that? And they all just looked and I said, exactly. Because if they, if your child doesn't have money in a special needs trust, then there's nobody out there that's going to be able to pay for those fun things that they're doing that go beyond what any government benefit covers. So those are the three main reasons to establish the special needs trust. Next slide. So I'm going to mute myself and Karen's going to play a little video about what is a trust. Families of people with disabilities often use trusts to set aside money for the future a trust is a special legal arrangement that puts a trusted person, a trustee, in charge of managing money for someone else, a beneficiary. A beneficiary can be anyone who has a hard time handling money themselves. In a special needs trust, the beneficiary is someone with a disability. Here's how the process usually works. In most trusts, a grantor, usually a family member, sets aside money, property, investments, or other assets for the beneficiary the grantor chooses a trustee to manage the assets for the benefit of the beneficiary. The beneficiary has no direct control over the assets and can't spend them. That's the role of the trustee. The beneficiary's needs and desires are taken into account, but the trustee has the final say over how the money is spent. And that's what makes a special needs trust so valuable. Somebody that is on means-based public benefits can only have $2,000 or less in assets. If they have more than $2,000 in assets, they're gonna be bumped off of those public benefits and that's not a good thing. Even though the beneficiary doesn't control the assets in a special needs trust, day-to-day, month-to-month spending decisions by the trustee can affect benefits if they violate any of the rules, laws, and policies that apply to benefits. That is where the ARC of Northern Virginia can play a crucial role. The greatest strengths of the ARC of Northern Virginia is their experience and their expertise in the special needs arena. They're not going to make a mistake in a distribution and bump somebody off of public benefits. The rules in special needs area change constantly and somebody that is not familiar enough with the special needs arena is not going to be able to keep up to date on those rules. And that's one reason why more than a thousand families have decided to entrust those tasks to the ARC of Northern Virginia and our partner, Key Bank. In our trusts, we divide the responsibilities of a trustee in two, adding the role of manager to the mix. 
ARC team members are experts on day-to-day -day trust spending decisions. Key Banks team are experts at managing and growing the money in a trust. Adding the ARC team as manager makes everyone's role easier and adds another level of confidence to the future of the beneficiary with special needs. There are a lot of things trust money can be used for, but there are things it can't be used for. Having experts at the ARC overseeing spending decisions takes a big burden off the family of a beneficiary. It was very overwhelming to me to realize that I needed to all of a sudden learn about um, Medicaid, Social Security, Special Needs Trust. Who had even heard of that? It is impossible to think of all the future needs of your family member. And this offers a sense of security for those who support that family member. The Ark of Northern Virginia Special Needs Trust Team works closely with Key Bank staff to make sure the planning, setup, funding, and operation of every trust runs smoothly. We'd love to talk to you about setting up a trust for you or a loved one with a disability. We serve people in Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and areas beyond. Our trust program is open to people with any disability. Here's how to get in touch. Thank you, Karen. So special needs trust, as you can see, anytime there's a trust, any kind of trust, you have to have a trustee. And with the trustee, we have selected key private banks. So on the left hand side, <clears throat> who's who for us, key bank is the trustee and the arc of Northern Virginia is the manager. That means we do the day to day client relations. We work with you. We work with your family. We work with the individual with disabilities, any agencies they may be working with. We troubleshoot, we help you with social security whenever issues arise with them, because inevitably they do. <clears throat> we work with Key Bank on reconciliations. We handle all of the disbursements. We push all the paperwork. We scan all the documents. And the trustee, it has the fiduciary responsibility. So they are responsible for investing the money and managing the money, providing account reporting and tax reporting and dispersing from the trust. So we review the disbursement records, what the request is, and then when it gets sent to Key Bank, they actually transfer the money or cut the check or put it on a debit card, depending on how the person's getting it. Uh, with the ARCS program, there are grantors. The grantors are the people that are establishing the trust and are the primary people funding that trust. The beneficiary is the person with disabilities. Primary representatives are our points of contact <clears throat> in the trust. So either the parents and or the person with disabilities or the, and the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, friends, whomever it is that you trust to be a part of the trust program and be allowed to talk to us. So for example, Key Bank's the trustee of the trust I have for the girls, ARC is the manager, Robert and I are the grantors, and then Sheridan has a trust as a beneficiary and Sky has a trust as a beneficiary. We're all primary representatives, so we can all make requests out of the trust when it's funded. And then I've added other people, my siblings, um, two nieces, friends of the family, some caregivers that have, we've worked with for nearly a decade at this point. Um, so I have a long list of people that I've prioritized. So as we age and as we die, the older generation, there'll be people that are eventually same age peers with my girls. So those are the primary representatives. They can make requests out of the trust. They can get copies of the trust documents. They can call and ask us questions. They can get money to take my girls to Disneyland if that's what they want to do. So they're there uh, to assist. And then with our trust program, we always also ask if there's any legal authority. That means, is there a power of attorney? Is there an agent under a power of attorney? If you remember when our kids turn 18, they reach what's called age of majority. So they're considered considered adults. And so 
Um, with my girls, I have, I'm their agent for financial and healthcare decisions. And that's helpful for the Ark of Northern Virginia to know because if when it's no longer me, it's going to be Allison, a friend of the family who's around the girl, a little 10 years older than the girls. And she'll be able to call in and, and ask questions and they'll have her name on file as well as the document, the power of attorney. And then remainderman, anytime there's a trust, you, the person establishing the trust has to decide, and this is important, so listen, this is important because you decide who will inherit whenever the beneficiary dies. So back to Sky and Sheridan, whomever dies first, what's left in their trust goes into her sister's trust. And when both my daughters are deceased, Robert and I have determined who will inherit at that point. So that's remainderment on a family funded special needs trust. If you go to an attorney or a financial institution, most often the parents are then the co-trustees or with a financial institution, the bank might also be a, a co-trustee and you have to name successor trustees. So when you die, who's going to take over the trust, right? And eventually you want to have same age peers. There may be a grantor or may not. Some trusts have it, some trusts don't. There's definitely a beneficiary. You may have a trust advocate in there, and that means that that person has some authority in the disbursements. So the trustee just cannot disperse, but he has to go to the trust or she has to go to the trust advocate to ask if um, they're allowed to disperse. And then remaindermen, same thing. You determine the people establishing the trust determine who will inherit on a family funded trust. So there are more roles in the ARCS trust. Uh, there's more family involvement and there's also more oversight, both within the ARC of Northern Virginia and Key Bank, as well as with other family members that you've indicated. They don't have to participate if they don't want to, those family members, but they're there if they wish to do so. So they're not burdened by any of the heavy lifting responsibilities of a trustee. They can be very involved or they can only be involved on the fringe. That's up to them at that point. Next slide. So didn't we just watch what is a trust, Karen? Yeah, fast forward that. Yeah. Right. There we go. Sorry. Okay, you went back. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. dear. I'm having twitchy it's, fingers. I apologize. That's okay. It's evening here. So there are two types of special needs trusts. There are third party trusts. And if you were standing, if I were standing in front of you, I would raise my right hand and say third party trusts. And there are first party trusts. There's a difference. A third party trust is established usually by family or friends or grandparents. It's either established with an attorney or financial institution, like we saw on the previous slide, or with a nonprofit like the Ark of Northern Virginia that's been authorized to manage trusts. The first party trust is, as there's a list of specific people who may establish it, it's when it's the individual's money as opposed to family money. So maybe um, the individual had an accident and you sued on their behalf but the individual's the victim, you settle outside of court, that's that person's money. So that money would go into a first party special needs trust. And there's no limit on what, how much goes into a special needs trust. You could put in $5 or you could put in $5 million and anywhere in between, right? There's no cap, there's no minimum, generally speaking. You either establish through an attorney or financial institution, depending on the size of the trust, or through a nonprofit like the Ark of Northern Virginia. And that's when it's called a pooled trust. Next slide. Yep, that's correct. So I didn't list everybody because I knew we had a slide coming up. So the third party trust is the family funded trust. And who establishes that? It's usually the parents, the relatives, or friends. It's usually funded through an inheritance, so through your last will and testament. 
a life insurance policy. So I have a life insurance policy. I own it. I'm insured. And the girls' trusts will receive 50% each, 50-50, into their trusts. You could have your own revocable trust and transfer from that to the special needs trust. You could contribute. Other people may contribute. Anybody can contribute. There could be other financial products like investments and retirement accounts. You could also put real property into a special needs trust, meaning real estate, whether they live in it or it's rented or mineral rights. So anything that's built on the property or which is in the property within the land. So the family funded or third party trust, and this is important, it's not the beneficiary's money. So the most important slides in this entire presentation are the one about third party aka family funded trusts and the first party because you'll see be able to see the difference what's the process when you're ready to establish the third party or family funded trust you could either reach out directly to the arc of northern virginia our attorneys have already written the documents they're all on our website but you would reach out to us and schedule an appointment we get information from you and fill out the draft and send it to you and then we have another meeting where we walk through the documents page by page. So you actually establish the trust directly with the ARC. Or you may go to an elder law attorney specializing in special needs or a bank to establish the trust. And Karen, can you pop in the first poll question about where everybody's from, please? So I'm gonna have you answer this so that I know what terminology I need to be using. Uh, could you let, let us know if Oh, this is, do you have a trust with the Ark of Northern Virginia? Oh, and then pop up the next one, which asks where they're from, Karen, please, after this is done. So apart from me, nobody else on here has a trust unless we have people from DSAGR that are signed up as panelists and not participants. So here we go, where are you from? DC, Maryland, or Virginia? Or if you're from somewhere other than one of those three places, put it in the chat for us to know. Okay, everybody's from Virginia, good. So I know what terminology to use. So <laughs> we can close that. Um, and I say that because in, in Virginia, you go to, if you're interested, in having your wills and powers of attorney written, you would work with an elder law attorney specializing in special needs. Um, when to fund it? Most people fund the special needs trust upon the death of the second to parent, the second parent to die. Now I'm divorced, and so it'll be funded when one of us dies, when Robert dies or I die. That'll be when it gets funded. So it's no longer second to die. It's upon the death of the first parent, but. Both of my daughter's trusts happen to be funded already. Somebody put money into Sheridan's trust a while ago, and then um, somebody also just put money into Sky's trust. Just a little bit of money, but it's nice to have a little bit of something in there, but you don't have to fund it until later. And you may fund the trust, grandma, grandpa may fund the trust, aunts and uncles, friends, they don't all have to be listed in the trust, but once you establish the special needs trust, the third party trust, you do write to your family members and say, hey, we write a special needs trust. And if you plan on leaving anything to Mary, Bobby, Tanisha, or, uh, or we some, make sure that you use this terminology, use this statement so that the money goes to their third party special needs trust. And as you can see, I have in red, we have in red there, what happens to the funds at the death of the beneficiary you decide who will inherit. So whoever goes first with my girls, the rest of their trust goes into the sister's trust. And when they're both deceased, Robert and I have determined who will inherit at that point. Next slide. So here's a video on family funded. Many families set up a special needs trust for a loved one with a disability. 
That's because a special needs trust does genuinely valuable things that no other structure can do. It provides for a trusted person to manage money and other assets for someone with a disability. It helps maintain eligibility for government benefits based on financial assets. It provides money for things that government benefits don't cover. It helps ensure long-term financial stability after parents can no longer provide care. All special needs trusts come with these benefits built in. Setting up a family-funded special needs trust with the ARC of Northern Virginia comes with additional benefits that our client families love. We searched around and there really wasn't any other organization that could um, manage the trust, manage special needs trust, and help us navigate through the process and help Brandon become more independent. When I met the people in ARC, I really trust them. They are just really nice people and they are the people you can trust. And ARC is a nonprofit organization who has a long history of helping people with a disability. I want somebody who understands the person I love and will help them manage that money in an effective way and really ensure that they're maximizing their public and private benefits. A family-funded trust is a legal arrangement that allows family members, friends, and others to set aside money and other assets for the benefit of someone with a disability. That person, the beneficiary, is the only person who cannot contribute to the trust. A trusted person, a trustee, manages the money for the beneficiary. As a result, the trust funds are not controlled by the beneficiary. That's why the amount of assets in a special needs trust does not affect eligibility for government benefits based on assets. Even before the trust is created, a critical decision is choosing someone to manage it. It's complicated, tricky, and time-consuming. Our solution is to split the duties of a trustee in two. Our team at the ARC of Northern Virginia takes on the role of manager, handling day-to-day -day spending decisions. Our partner, Key Bank, serves as trustee, minding checks and bill paying, as well as long-term investing. It's a powerful combination, and all of our more than 1,700 special needs trusts are set up with the ARC as manager and Key Bank as trustee. Having two sets of professionals on your side pays off from day one. I met people in ARC of um, Northern Virginia. They just showed me how capable they are and how I can trust them and the experience they have. Um, it just made me make the decision that they are the one I'm going to use as the trust manager. We looked at other organizations to do a special needs trust and we just didn't feel like they had the body of knowledge that the ARC had. We'd love to talk to you about setting up a trust for you or a loved one with a disability. We serve people in Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and areas beyond. Our trust program is open to people with any disability. Here's how to get in touch. Thank you, Karen. All the contact information, if I didn't mention it before, will be on this little slide as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so that was the family funded trust. So that's something that we as parents do or other family members or friends establish and then go back and check the will and the financial products, the life insurance, the retirement accounts, the bank accounts to make sure that the money you want to go to your child is actually directed to their special needs trust. And this is really, this is very different from an ABLE account because as you know, the ABLE has a $15,000 annual aggregate contribution limit and so a trust, you can put in 15,000 or again, 5 million or 500,000 or 32,000 or whatever, it doesn't matter. And anyone may contribute to it, just not the person with disabilities. So what happens if the person with disabilities has money? So this is where the left hand comes up. They need to establish a first party or self-funded special needs trust. And federal statute says that that may be established by the individual with disabilities their parent, grandparent, guardian with a capital G, meaning there's a legal document saying that somebody's a guardian. It may be court ordered or an agent under a power of attorney. So there are specific people or specific roles that would set up a self-funded special needs trust. And these are established whenever somebody ends up in an oops, what am I going to do now situation? Usually that's when you establish it. They receive an unexpected inheritance. Um, Aunt Josie dies in Arizona and leaves $50,000 to Melissa. 
and Melissa has Medicaid. She needs to move that money into a first party special needs trust immediately within the month in which it's received in order for it not to count against her Medicaid, her Medicaid waiver, supplemental security income, et cetera, because that would bring her over the asset limit of $2,000, right? $2,000 at any given time. Maybe there's a lump sum payback from Social Security. We had someone who was in a group home, the program manager changed and said, why is this person getting supplemental security income? The parents are deceased. He should be getting Social Security disability, meaning he could piggyback on his parents' Social Security. Long story short, he had an $80,000 lump sum payback. And they contacted me and said, we tried spending it. We sent him on two cruises, bought him a recliner. recliner. He has a new bedroom suite. They spent $40,000 on random things before they reached out to us. At that point, we put it into a first party trust. And now the money's there to pay for things when he needs them instead of trying to spend it down. And maybe a jury decision. So somebody had an accident and they did not settle outside of court, but the jury decided that the person should get a, a chunk of money for what happened, or they did settle outside of court. And so that settlement would be irrevocably assigned to a first party trust. The individual could be making money. It could go into a first party trust, adult child support. So when a child is 18, if there was child support involved and it's continuing and it can and may and should continue after the age of 18, then that would need to be irrevocably assigned to a first party trust as well so that it doesn't count as income to the adult child. Even if the mother or the father is getting the support check, if it's child support, it's considered the child's money at 18. We work with a lot of uh, retired military, the military survivor benefit, the SBP is um, irrevocably assigned to a first party trust and alimony, and it might be planned, Karen, we may need to change that. And alimony or the lottery, we have somebody that won the lottery. So bottom line, it's the beneficiary's money that goes into a self-funded trust, okay? Not family money, the beneficiary's money. The process is the same. You can reach out to the Ark of Northern Virginia and we can establish the first party trust, go to an attorney or a bank. Now a bank has a very high minimum for a, a special needs trust, both first party and third party if they're to be the trustees of it. So they'll want a million dollars or more generally to manage that. Unless you're further away, you know, you're out in Western Virginia and you know, some of the banks will manage smaller trusts. Why do you establish it? Well, it's to protect those benefits or maybe somebody needs to apply for benefits. We had a client who was typically developing, working, making money, had investment accounts, had retirement accounts, and then was in an automobile accident. It is now permanently 100% disabled. And that person needs to apply for Medicaid. And so they established the first party trust, moved his assets into the trust, and now they can apply for Medicaid and a Medicaid waiver. It's also established when somebody can't manage their money. Again, the same scenario. Um, a lot of clients that have mental health diagnosis have first party trust. They had maybe been working and were saved or have money and they wanted to move it in or they had an IRA account and then their disability became so severe that they could no longer work and they needed to apply for benefits. So they would set up a first party trust and move their assets into that and then apply for benefits. Now there's a difference, see the red on here, there's a difference between the family funded trust where it's your money and you decide who inherits when your child passes away. On the first party trust, there's a Medicaid payback and then the heirs at law, or you may leave it to the foundation of the Ark of Northern Virginia. So you can make a charitable contribution to the Ark instead of Medicaid payback. That's only on first party trusts. It's not family funded trusts. And that's why it's important to have all your documents in order before you die, because you wanna make sure that the money you intend to go to your child with disabilities goes to that third party family funded trust. So it doesn't count as an asset. 
and you determine who inherits when they're gone. Next slide. This is on the first party trust. Go ahead, Karen. Unexpected income sounds like good news, and it can be. But sometimes, if someone with a disability gets a sum of money unexpectedly, that windfall could end up being a real problem. Here's why. Some disability benefits programs have an asset limit of $2,000. Having unexpected money come your way could also mean suddenly having more money than a program allows, and that could reduce or interrupt benefits. And even if government benefits aren't a factor, there's a risk the money could be misspent by someone who doesn't manage money well. Either way, unexpected money can be preserved and protected. A self-funded special needs trust with the Ark of Northern Virginia is an effective way to be ready for the unexpected and to have a solid plan for the future. We're experts at managing special needs trusts, and that's why more than 1,700 individuals have their special needs trusts with us. The greatest strengths of the Ark of Northern Virginia is their experience and their expertise in the special needs arena. They're not going to make a mistake in a distribution and bump somebody off of public benefits. I, I think the biggest value that we see as having ARC as the manager is the fact that they really understand all the different needs that Brandon might have. And I think that, that was huge for us. Here are some basics. A special needs trust is a legal arrangement that sets aside assets for a beneficiary, someone with a disability. A trusted person, a trustee, manages the money for the beneficiary with a disability. As a result, the amount of money in a trust does not affect someone's eligibility for benefits with asset limits. A self-funded trust is called for when assets are in the name of the person with special needs. The assets might come from an unexpected inheritance or a legal settlement, such as a personal injury award. It could be child support for someone who has turned 18. It could be spousal support after a divorce. Sometimes money comes from the U.S. Military Survivor Benefit Program, or as a lump sum payment of Social Security benefits. And of course, you could win the lottery. There are several people who can set one up. The beneficiary himself or herself, their parents or grandparents, or a guardian can do this. Someone with financial power of attorney for the beneficiary can do it too. At times, the court may order the creation of a self-funded trust. Even before the trust is created, a critical decision is choosing someone to manage it. It's complicated, tricky, and time-consuming. Our solution is to split the duties of a trustee in two. Our team at the Ark of Northern Virginia takes on the role of manager, handling day-to-day -day spending decisions. Our partner, Key Bank, serves as trustee, minding checks and bill paying, as well as long-term investing. It's a powerful combination, and all of our more than 1,700 special needs trusts are set up with the ARC as manager and KeyBank as trustee. Having two sets of professionals on your side pays off from day one. The rules in special needs area change constantly, and somebody that is not familiar enough with the special needs arena is not going to be able to keep up to date on those rules. It's a very complex process to go through, and when you're doing it, um, on an emergency basis or when you were in a crisis, it's even more stressful. We'd love to talk to you about setting up a trust for you or a loved one with a disability. We serve people in Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and areas beyond. Our trust program is open to people with any disability. Here's how to get in touch. Thank you, Karen. So this is everything that we as the manager do together with KeyBank. If you had a trust with us, this is all the work we would be doing. If you establish a trust through an attorney and your co-trustees of that trust, you would have very little of this work to do because you're not usually funding it fully until you're both deceased. So it's really the successor trustees who have the burden of the work 
when it comes to managing and administering a special needs trust, right? So when it's unfunded, it's just sitting there waiting for us to die. And then when we're deceased and it gets funded with a larger amount of money, this that's when all the work begins. So what is it that a trustee would do? Well, they have to <clears throat> invest the money and manage the money. They have to manage the account reporting and tax reporting. They're also responsible for check writing and dispersing or transferring the money to a credit card or however the funds are being allocated. And the trustee, if it were a private trust, if you look in the left column, column, they would also have to understand current benefit eligibility requirements. So when they disperse from the trust, they don't make a mistake. You'd want them following your wishes and considering the beneficiary's needs and priorities. And so that's the work that they need to be doing. There's reconciliation, of course. There's account reporting, right? They need to be keeping track of the paperwork, the bills, the receipts, the invoices, and whatnot. Whenever the Ark of Northern Virginia and Key Bank are administering the special needs trust, in addition to that, we're also experts in providing services to people with disabilities. We're in a unique position in that we're a nonprofit first and with a mission statement to advocate for the human rights of people with IDD. We have a competitive fee schedule, progressive fee schedule for our larger accounts. And if you have or eventually would be putting more than $250,000 in the trust, say upon your death, then you may customize investments. You would work directly with our financial advisor at Key Bank to determine how you wanted the money invested, or you could transfer any investments you have as is. So let's say you have Apple stock and you want to transfer the Apple stock, the Microsoft, whatever you have. We can also hold real property. And Key Bank, in addition to being the trustee, they'll function as executor of your estate if you have no one, so in your last will and testament, as well as a successor trustee on your own family trust. Okay, so that's a lot of the work that we do, then most of it is something that your own trustee would have to do. Of course, the investment bit is different whenever it's a, a private trust. Um, there's not really talk of customizing investments. It's however you have that money invested. So that's between you and the trustee successor. Next slide. You went back. Oh, this is us again. Okay, go ahead, Karen. From shoelaces to vacation travel, from buying a car to buying a stapler, the funds and special needs trust fill gaps that government benefits don't cover. And keeping those benefits requires not spending trust funds on what the benefits do cover. Knowing what to buy and what not to buy is just part of handling a special needs trust. A trustee's job is managing a trust to benefit a person with a disability. That comes with a lot of responsibilities and can be a lot of work. You end up as a in, as individuals doing this with all kinds of needs for money management and accounting and all kinds of things which puts a pretty heavy burden on whoever becomes the trustee. But there is an alternative. The Ark of North Virginia offers an approach that divides the duties of a trustee in two between two sets of experts. Our special needs trust team serves as manager and our partner Key Bank takes on the role of trustee. As trust manager, we work with beneficiaries and their families to set up trusts, make budgets, and review day-to-day -day spending decisions. As trustee, Key Bank focuses on safeguarding and growing the money in a trust. We work closely with Key Bank so every payment is done right and recorded properly. We were such novices, we really didn't know what we were doing. The kind of services that the ARC was willing to provide were very important to me because they would keep Nicholas safe and always provide him with what he needed. I won't always have the ability to know the intricate details of the Social Security requirements that are constantly changing or the Virginia laws that have, make no sense and I could never keep up with, but that's something they are keeping up with. In our role as trust manager, we take a proactive, hands-on approach. We review every trust spending decision. 
We listen to our beneficiaries with disabilities. We take their needs and desires into account. We ensure spending is in line with rules, policies, and budget. We help make connections to resources and professionals in the community. ARC knows what the rules are with respect to special needs planning. They, uh, they can keep that person on public benefits. They're aware of what other public benefits are out there and available for this person. And they're always going to be an advocate. We make the trust process easier because we patiently guide everyone through trust setup and ongoing management. Simpler because we've developed an efficient process that reduces the number of steps you need to follow and safer because we keep up to date on rules regarding trust payments and government benefits. So instead of booting him out of the services where we waited so long to get them now, he is safe. And that's the point that my son is safe. Our special needs trust team helps plan and maintain budgets. That's the key to making sure trust funds last as long as possible and are used as wisely as possible. We account for all the things a beneficiary needs. We look at all sources of income, not just trust money, to be sure money coming in is in line with money going out. We focus on meeting the needs of our special needs trust clients every day. We are a nonprofit committed to the lives and fulfillment of people with disabilities. Our unique approach has attracted an ever-growing number of families since we began the program in 1999. Confidence is key. Having a trust uh, through the Arc of Northern Virginia gives me so much confidence and peace of mind that if something happened with me and my husband, uh, our son Jesse will have a life, will have future, and will have people who will take care of him. We'd love to talk to you about setting up a trust for you or a loved one with a disability. We serve people in Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and areas beyond. Our trust program is open to people with any disability. Here's how to get in touch. Thank you, Karen. Well, this talks about how our team supports our special needs trust clients. So before the trust is funded, we educate and plan with a family. So I offer one free consultation, as does Ashley, a, a, a woman I hired in April, and we'll help prepare the trust paperwork and we facilitate the trust plan preparation. So the trust plan is like a letter of intent. It's a document that talks about um, the individual with disabilities, who they are, what they like, and what the intent is for their future, and how you see the trust fund being spent, and how you see them living, working, recreating their spirituality, and things like that. KeyBank reviews and approves the trust documents. They troubleshoot special situations, and they help ensure compliance. And then once the trust is funded, we review and process client disbursement requests, we ensure that each disbursement aligns with the grantor's priorities and the beneficiary's needs, so what the parents want and what the individual, the child needs. We maintain up-to-date documents and trust plans, and we coordinate with the case managers and other stakeholders uh, supporting the beneficiary. And Key Bank, as the trustee, they process the disbursements they, dis they distribute the account statements on a monthly basis. They conduct trust reviews. They manage the tax reporting, the account reporting, the investing. You choose the investment option. There are eight investment options from which to choose. And they manage the real estate. So there's a lot of work going into the special needs trust. And um, we're there to help do all of that work so that you don't have to worry about whether or not it's getting done, getting done correctly, whether benefits are being jeopardized, whether too much money is being spent on an annual monthly basis, et cetera. So we're there to do all the heavy lifting, allowing any family members or friends that you've named as potential primary representatives to be there to help disperse from the trust, trust and um, help with other things. Right. If you had your own trust and you were the co-trustees and let's say you named your sister as a successor trustee, when you died, if she took over, she would be responsible for doing everything that's on this page when it comes to trust administration. Next slide.
So we have established over 1,800 trusts to date. There's over, we're managing over $50 million in trust. We've been a, a program since 1999, and we serve families in Virginia, Maryland, and D.C., and then in other areas of the United States as well. So we focus on, we have experience, we're empathetic, and we have the expertise that's required to administer a special needs trust. So I've been living this for 27 plus years and um, two times over. So I not only have the personal experience, but also the professional experience. Karen, next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about the disbursement process and then we can take a break. So whenever there's a trust, again, because we're talking about special needs trusts, whoever is managing or administering that trust, whether it's the trustee or it's the Ark of Northern Virginia managing it, there needs to be a record of how the funds in the trust are being spent. If it's a trustee, it's your sister managing it, you're gone and your sister's managing it, you want to make sure to tell her she needs to keep the receipts, the invoices, the bills. Anytime money is, goes out of that trust, she should have a record of how that money was spent for the benefit of the individual. With the Ark of Northern Virginia, we have an extra sheet of paper. We ask you to fill out a disbursement request form. It's very simple. We also have ones that are recurring, like if he goes to the same dentist or the cell phone bill or a health insurance premium, things like that, that are more than a one-off, one-time thing. And we can keep a recurring disbursement request form on file. So every time that phone bill comes every month, then we just attach that to the bill and send it to key bank to process. We gather, we ask you to gather the receipts, the invoice, the bills, the training invoice, and send the disbursement request form and the documentation to the ARC. And then we verify that. So the account, my account team, whoever's responsible for that request, they look to see, is it for the benefit? First of all, does that person have a trust with us? Is it funded? Is this request for their benefit? Is it jeopardizing any? benefits, Medicaid, Medicaid waiver, things like that, that they may be receiving? Is it how you wanted the money spent? Is it signed by a primary representative? Because that's what that primary representative needs to do is sign those forms. Is it legal? Is it legitimate? So we go through a process and we do this five days a week, Monday through Friday, unless there's a holiday. And then they send it to me and then I either approve it because we have sole discretion. We either say yes, 98% of them are approved because people understand the process and we're there to answer those questions, how a trust works. It gets disapproved. Someone wanted to, to deplete their brother's trust and buy, put a down payment on a vacation home somewhere. We said no and we justify it. When we say no, we justify it. If it's a yes, it gets processed. You don't receive anything from us to say it's, it's okay uh, unless you call or email to ask or it may be pending. Okay, you want us to pay the dental bill out of the trust, but we don't have the invoice yet. So if we have a relationship with a dentist, we may call them and ask them to send us the invoice or the primary representative can do that, which can also be the person with disabilities. So, and then we scan everything that we have. All of our documents are electronic. They're on a, a server that's managed by a financial um, business that also has our database and that's all available if Medicaid or Social Security came back and wanted to and requested an account reporting of the trust. How is the money being spent? Because they can do that to trust, they can do that to ABLE accounts. They can ask for an account reporting. We just bring up the documents, we have everything scanned and send it. Next slide. So we're going to take a five-minute break here. I have 8.01, so at 8.06, we'll start up again. Get up and stretch your legs maybe, get a drink of water, go check on the kids, and I'll see you back in five minutes. Here we go. And so now the next slide is talking about our fee schedule. So if you were to establish a trust with an elder law attorney, they usually start, <coughs> excuse me, at around $1,000. 
<clears throat> sorry, to establish the trust. And then some, some attorneys may have, and then they charge by the hour after that or six minute or 10 minute increments. Some may have package deals. They may offer you a will, powers of attorney and the trust for a certain fee. So if you were taking that route, or if you didn't need them to do the, your wills and powers of attorney, <coughs> excuse me, only then you do want to ask them upfront what it's going to cost. And they're used to having that question asked. With the ARC of Northern Virginia, we have a one-time enrollment fee. So that is $1,050, 1050 to establish the special needs trust. That covers the meeting that we, you know, it's usually a 80 hour, me, 80 hour, excuse me, 80 minutes meeting to establish the trust, walk through the document page by page. You may have questions prior to and afterwards. My staff may be emailing you to ask you for things because we need a copy of an ID or something like that. So all of that communication in regards to the special needs trust is, is, is included in that $1,050. And then after the fact, we're there to answer your questions as well. If you have a need to establish another special needs trust, either for the same individual or their sibling, then we offer it at, at half price. So those of you that saw my presentation years ago at the church, in Richmond, we still have the buy one, get one half off special. And that is like in the situation where I have two children beneficial, or if you have somebody needs a first party and a third party trust. So it's really nice. And we do that because you're already clients of ours. We've already established a relationship. We have a lot of the information already that we need to have to complete the document. And so it's a, a courtesy uh, option that we provide. If you choose not to put any money in the trust, which is fine, so that's considered unfunded, on the first anniversary of establishing the trust, we would invoice you for $65. We call that an annual maintenance fee. At that point, we follow up with you and say, has anybody moved? Do you need to make any changes? Do we have to amend this document? What needs to happen? or when the trust is funded, or I should say, and then when the trust is funded, so some people do put money in a trust, like I mentioned, some people have contributed to each of my daughter's special needs trusts. And instead of the $65, the annual management and trust fee is 1.49%. So that is, um, sorry, I'm making a note here. That is, the annual fee, it gets charged um, on a monthly basis. So it's one twelfth of 1.49%. And this is a um, competitive fee. So we always are going back to key bank and negotiating the trustee fee to lower it. So it is competitive. And then the we have a progressive fee schedule for trusts over a million dollars. And then the only other fee we charge is a closeout fee of $250. And that's if the person dies or the trust is about to be depleted. That's an administrative fee to close out the trust. Um, making a note here, sorry. So it's either $65 or 1.49% of the corpus of the trust. Some people choose to fund it in advance so that for example, Sheridan has a credit card or off the special needs trust. And so we set up a recurring disbursement request. So every month, $200 would go on her card and she would use that for transportation, movie tickets, um, not clothes because she doesn't really buy clothes, books, um, things like that, stuff she likes to buy. And it's a good way to get her to save receipts look at managing her money and then working with my colleagues at the Ark of Northern Virginia. So she develops a, a working relationship with them way before I die, hopefully way before I die. Um, so she doesn't have to worry and I don't have to worry when I'm gone. She knows what to do with that card and with her special needs trust. Next slide. Karen, thank you. Okay, so now we're going to jump to the ABLE Act. 
So what is the ABLE Act? It's Achieving a Better Life Experience. It was signed on December 19th, 2014 by President Barack Obama, and it authorizes states to create a new category of savings programs for people with disabilities who qualify. Just like with special needs trusts, the assets in the account, ABLE account, as long as it complies, um, assets held in accounts that comply with ABLE will not affect eligibility for Medicaid, SSI, or subsidized housing. There's a caveat to the SSI, we'll let you know. It's used only for qualified disability related purposes, which is different from a special needs trust. The special needs trust is for the benefit of the individual. It doesn't have to be um, qualified or disability related. And the family funded trust can be used even to gift people. So Sheridan could buy me a Christmas present with the money in her, trust, in her trust if she wanted to. And with an ABLE account though, it's qualified disability related purposes. It was when established, they were meant to be transition, transactional accounts for people with disabilities who could manage their own money. But if they had that money, it would be a problem and they would lose their benefits. People now are using it more as a savings mechanism in addition to a special needs trust. So you would have both. A lot of people have both. I don't have ABLE accounts for either of my daughters at this point because I, they don't need them. I don't have any discretionary money that I need to be putting into an ABLE or first party trust. Any money that I have, I'm, I'm investing it. And then when I die, again, I've designated 50% to Sheridan's trust and 50% to Skye's. Next slide. So we've done a little comparative chart here to give you some facts. So ABLE accounts, onset of disability is important. The qualifying disability has to exist. Karen, there's a typo there in the first line. It should say exist and not exits. Exist prior to 26. Um, that is not so with a special needs trust. There's no qualifying disability age on a special needs trust. Who may establish it? With the ABLE, it's the beneficiary, the parent, the guardian, an agent. So there's a list of people who may establish the ABLE account for the individual with disabilities. They may have one ABLE account. You can have 27 special needs trusts if you want, but you may only have one ABLE account. The second one or any ABLE account after the first one counts as an asset and that could it would jeopardize benefits. The fees, are, they have financial institution fees. They're minimal compared to the special needs trust. They're usually less. There are contribution limits on an ABLE, not on a trust, but on an ABLE, it's 15,000 per year. And then the total is capped at the state limit for 529. So Virginia, it's 500,000. So that would take, I don't know, somebody has to do the math for me. I should have done it 30 years. 35, 37 years or something to hit that cap of 500,000. Um, <clears> but it's a question of whether or not you would want that much money in an ABLE account. Um, and then SSI payments may be suspended whenever the assets total $100,000. There are investment options. Usually there are three investment options. Virginia has two ABLEs, the ABLE now, and then the other one that's America something. I can't remember, but there are more investment options in that one. They have to be valid distributions, broadly defined as disability expenses, taxes. So this is a bonus. The earned income is tax-free in an ABLE account. That is not true in a trust. In the ABLE account, the earned income is tax-free. There is a potential federal Medicaid payback. There's no, Virginia has removed the state Medicaid payback but there's the feds still have the ability to come back. So with Medicaid, state plan Medicaid, it's funded 50% by the feds and 50% by the state. So even though Virginia has currently waived that Medicaid payback, the federal government has not. And then the beneficiary's income may go into a, an ABLE account under a, the ABLE to Work Act. That individual may contribute up to an additional 12,490 um, in assets, or excuse me, in contributions from their paycheck. If 
they're not contributing to an employer sponsored retirement plan. So if they're working for Booz Allen and they have a 401k and the person's contributing to the 401k, they cannot contribute their income in excess to that amount, um, in excess to the 15,000. So you have to be aware of that. And these are the most basic, bigger, able facts that we showed you. Next slide. So what is a qualified disability expense? It's defined as being related to blindness or disability of the designated beneficiary, and it has to be for the benefit of the designated beneficiary. So no gifting out of an ABLE account. And then they have broad categories. So it has to be disability related expense, whether it's educational, housing, employment, training and support, Basic living expenses, food, and um, the one under housing, that's important because those are not counted by Social Security. That's a whole other presentation. We won't go into detail there. Next slide. But that's a good thing, and we help people establish the ABLE accounts if they need to be using it um, for their rent. And what is a qualified disability expense? So the IRS does the annual tax reporting and excuse me able sends it to the irs the irs may investigate the distributions from an able account to determine whether a withdrawal was for a qualified disability expense if the funds in the able are spent on non-eligible expenses you have to pay taxes on the growth plus a 10 percent penalty on those earnings Non-qualified withdrawals are considered income for that month and could count against eligibility for SSI benefits and Medicaid. SSA um, also receives account reporting from ABLE on a monthly basis. And then if the person is receiving SSI Medicaid housing, state federal agencies may investigate any distribution to determine whether the withdrawal was for a qualified disability expense. Now, if somebody has SSI, Medicaid, or housing, when it is a trust, they may come back and ask how the funds were spent, but we don't have that qualified disability expense. It can be used so long as it's for the benefit of the individual or it's not, and it's not jeopardizing any of their benefits. We always wanna make sure it doesn't do that. And from the ABLE site as well, it tells you they strongly recommend record keeping, including receipts in case of an audit. So the ABLE account falls under the um, Treasury Department. And so they could actually come back, the IRS could come back and, and audit the ABLE account. We haven't seen any of this happen yet. It's too new. It usually takes them several years before, they, before any of these agencies start um, asking for audits and reporting on them. But so there's, I'm sure it's going to happen sooner than later now that so much time has gone by. Is that the last slide, Karen? No. So here's the summary. The strengths of the ARC Special Needs Trust Program. Remember, we serve the Commonwealth of Virginia, the state of Maryland, the District of Columbia, and beyond. We're in a unique position in that we're a nonprofit first to and we advocate for the human rights of people with disabilities and believe in their full inclusion in, in society, in the community, as opposed to a, a nonprofit that's established only to manage trusts. Trust is just one of the things that we do. We're experts on current disability regulations. There's minimal family responsibility when it comes to administering the trust. You may be as involved as you wish to be or as uninvolved. We have multiple checks and balances when it comes to disbursements in-house and low fees. Key Bank, as the trustee, is regulated by all the banking regulations, so there's extensive oversight over what they're doing. You may fund the trust with seed money. It's a minimum of $300 if you choose. Uh, we're, we're responsible for the account and tax reporting. You have multiple investment options as well as customized investments. If you choose with um, to fund it with more than $250,000 at some point, it, we can hold real property and accept in-kind transfers of stock. Next slide. 
now it's questions. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to jump over to the questions and we can, so Jonathan asked, does money from a SMT get taxed when withdrawn? Okay. So first I'm not a CPA and we always recommend you talk to your financial advisor or a, um, your accountant for this information. It, the answer, the short answer is it depends because whenever they're doing that, whenever key bank or the trustee or the CPA, whomever's responsible for your account reporting, wherever you have that trust or tax reporting, they have to look at contributions to the trust, distributions from the trust, gains, losses, and before they even do that, by the way, they look at the, there's a potential $4,000 plus federal deduction that they can apply. So if there's a balance between income or growth of the assets and distributions, then the taxation is minimal. But so that's the, that's the most I can answer on that question. Um, we need to talk to a CPA. We have when you have a trust with us or if you're interested in having a trust with us and we've had a consultation if you and that's you have one free 50-minute consultation with me or ashley um, that's always there in addition to our trust talk tuesdays and the first fridays and our financial fitness fridays all those things on the left and the special needs trust programs those badges on my picture here um, but if you've had a consultation with us you can always speak to the financial advisor for free at KeyBank if you want to, if you have some tax questions. Having said that, a reminder, and Karen, you can put this in the chat, and then whenever you send everybody the um, links and other things, make sure you send them the upcoming presentations and first Friday dates and Trust Talk Tuesdays, etc. Um, on November 4th, I believe, looking at my calendar, October, November, on November 4th at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. we have Meet the Trustee. So our trust, it's going to be via Zoom as well, but our trustees will be available to answer any type of questions, whether it's tax related, administering, functioning as an executor, fees, investments, all those kinds of things. So on November 4th, 10 a.m. or 7 p.m., that's available. Um, Natalia, is there an annual cap? No, there is no cap on contributions to a special needs trust. Not with our trust program. There is not. Calandra, is there a minimum amount you have to contribute to start the SNT? No, there is not. Um, you can have a special needs trust and it may be what's called unfunded, so there's no money in the trust. So originally when we established the trust for Sky and Sheridan, it was just sitting there empty waiting to be funded, right? Um, and then somebody contributed. Can a person have one self-funded and one family-funded trust? Yes, they may. They may have seven self-funded and five family-funded. So you can have as many trusts as you want. And we have a lot of clients that have both self-funded and family-funded because they need them, right? Because it's different money going into them. Family-funded is anybody's money but the beneficiary and self-funded is the beneficiary's money. Does spending have to be reported when filing year-end taxes? So on the family-funded trust, it's an entity in itself. So if it's the trust is with us, then Key Bank reports, um, does an annual report to the IRS per each trust, usually it happens in late March, early April, that they get sent to the IRS. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a $4,000 federal deduction that may be considered, and then they look at growth, losses, disbursements, contributions. So that's, if it's a self-funded trust, then KeyBank creates a K-1 and sends it to whomever is getting the monthly account statements in case taxes need to be filed. So I never have filed, well, the girls only have family funded, but um, if it's a self-funded trust and you're not, and maybe you've done some spending and the person doesn't have a job, 
then you may not be filing taxes on their behalf, right? So you may or may not. So again, that's an open, <laughs> it's hard to answer them specifically because it's unique to the situation. Is there a benefit to start the trust sooner or is it okay when the kids are older? So as I always mention, when this question comes up, I asked my sister that, one of my sisters that question and she said, why wait? And I said, you're absolutely right. Why wait? So there are, there, there are several things that you need to do in order to make sure that your futures planning, that's what it's called, has been taken care of. Meaning that you've checked off all the boxes on the list that of the things that need to be taken care of as you're planning for your future as well as the future of your child with disabilities. So you wanna have a special needs trust for that person. You want to have your own last will and testament. You probably want to have a financial, adorable, a durable, D-U-R-A-B-L-E, financial power of attorney, as well as a health proxy that includes an advanced medical directive. You want to have those things in place. So each spouse would have their own will, their own power of attorney for financial and for health. And then you could have one special needs trust. It's important to do that sooner than later. So futures planning is planning for the worst and hoping for the best. And so why wait is what I'm going to say. There's really no need to wait to establish the special needs trust. And if it's a question of not being able to afford the enrollment fee, we offer a payment plan it's $87.50 a month, $87.50 a month for 12 months. That's $10.50 divided by 12. So we don't charge interest fees or penalties on that. But you know, why wait? Get it done now if you can. Um, I have another question. If we develop a will to leave funds to a trust, can the trustee then you decide to use your services as a third party trust? Yes. Most any trust document I've seen that's been a, written by an attorney where the family members have named somebody else to be the successor trustee. Like Robert and I originally had, we were co-trustees of special needs trust for each of our girls. And we named my sister Phyllis as a successor trustee. And then we all got older. I started working at the Ark of Northern Virginia. And I said, why am I doing this to her? Why would I, you know, the ARC is, we are experts in what we do. That makes so much more sense just having the ARC do it. Now that was an unfunded trust. So we established the new trust with the ARC and simply revoked the old special needs trusts. That original trust document though, that we had with the attorney did say, if the successor trustees are unwilling or unable to function as trustees of the trust, then this is what's to happen. And one of those options is to establish a trust with a financial institution or that a nonprofit organization. So most attorneys, Kim, will write that clause in the trust document. So you want to go back and re if you already have a trust through an attorney, you want to go back and review that trust document to verify that the language is in it. Karen, I think you're unmuted on one of your, the Ark of Northern Virginia is not muted. Thank you. Um, and then are there any estimators which help understand how much funds will be needed for an adult with a disability to live comfortably above what is provided by government assistance? So good question. Also another good question. I have not seen that because of the variables, right? I can tell you that I have seen that a person needs about $3.2 million to live. With the money, if the money's invested, they need that for a lifetime without any government benefits, right? No government benefits. When a person has government benefits, what I tell families is plan for your retirement and whatever's left over, divide it among your children or wherever you want it to go. But <coughs> I've not seen a number. I will tell you that one of our trust clients had $500,000 in their trust and didn't spend a lot because one of the primary, the primary representative was the sister 
And we just had to go and ask again and again and again for this, for this person to be allowed to have this, that, and the other thing. That was a little troublesome. Um, we knew this beneficiary very well. But that money lasted until the person died. That person died in the mid-55, at the age of 55, way too early, way too soon. But that that five hundred thousand dollars would make was maintained for over twenty years because of the investments and the use. Because the, whenever government benefits were available, we made sure that that person was using their government benefits instead of the trust. But we also have another trust client who, when they die, there's a twenty five thousand dollar life insurance policy. That's what the grant. That's what the mom. That's what the grantor could afford, and so that's what's going to fund the trust whenever she dies. So. The short answer is no, there is not a calculator. With our kids, kids with Down syndrome in Virginia will most likely be found eligible for the Developmental Disability Medicaid Waiver. And that covers many, many services. Housing or the community living, which is 24 seven or sponsored residential. FIS is housing, but there's also transportation, there's in-home supports, community integration. Um, it could be it's a day program, skilled nursing, assistive technology, environmental modification. There's a whole slew of these services that Medicaid will pay for for our kids. In addition to that, if they're getting Social Security and that the Medicaid is covering their health assurance and they eventually get Medicare as well, there aren't a lot of other expenses. But what, there, what you do need to calculate is dental care. That's costly. We regularly see bills for $20,000 for dental care. Uh, transportation, even when Medicaid covers transportation, it is not reliable. And so that's how Sheridan started getting $200 on her card every month. She was taking a lift whenever the transportation wouldn't show up. Um, or if she would take a lift to the movies or something like that. So dental transportation, any health care premiums could come out of the trust, funeral, burial, cremation, whatever that's going to be, vacations, you want to plan for vacations, you want to plan for new furniture at least two to three times during their lifetime. Um, and so again, it's what you can afford, but what we do is, or not but, but what we do is that when the trust is fully funded, we look at the person's benefits, make sure that they're getting everything they possibly can be getting, and if they're not, then we provide them with assistance on what needs to be done to get those benefits. And then we create a budget. What's going out and what's coming in. And then we help them with their spending to maintain those assets, those investments that they have in the trust for as long as possible based on the average lifespan of the American male or female. So lengthy, long-winded question, but I've not seen a calculator like that, Kim, because there are too many variables involved. Any more questions? You can probably unmute yourself and ask your question at this point since we have a smaller group. Okay, let me look here. Karen, can you think of anything I've forgotten? No, I think you're pretty good. Okay, so a review, family funded is created by the parents, grandparents, family members, or friends. You come directly to the Ark of Northern Virginia to establish it or an elder law attorney. You don't have to worry about successor trustees with us because we have a binding agreement with Key Bank that functions as our trustee. There are legal documents explaining all that and it's all on our website. If the person comes into money unexpectedly or they want to put their money into a first party trust or there's a settlement agreement, that's where the first party trust comes in. You may participate in, can you mute yourself again, Karen, so my video can come up here, my screen. Can, okay, so my, I don't know why, but I'm not coming up full screen again. Sorry. 
Karen, I'm trying to get you off the screen and get me on, and I'm not sure why it's not working. I'll do it this way. Um, if you look on the the badges on the left, it's the Trust Talk Tuesday. So that's twice a month. It's a facilitated roundtable. I either facilitate it or Ashley and Evelyn together. And that's just an opportunity to learn more about trusts, but also to ask us any questions you may have on disability benefits. First Friday's futures planning. It's normally the first Friday of every month. And I invite community experts to present on a variety of topics. This Friday, it's on housing in Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, DC. So we have four experts speaking to housing. Next month, like I said, on the fourth, we'll have Meet the Trustee. And on the fifth, it's about holding real estate and trust. And in December, it's on Social Security. So there's it changes every month. We always record them. And they're always found on our website after the fact. Every other month, we have a Financial Fitness Friday. So September, we just had, thank goodness, it's Financial Fitness Friday. Next month in October, it'll be on Special Needs Trusts. And these are all free and open to the public. You may attend as frequently as you wish. And we invite you to attend. And then check out the videos and the documents on our website. And I don't know, Kim, do you have anything you'd like to ask or add here at the end? If we have no more questions? No, I don't have anything. I appreciate this. They all know how to get a hold of you. They can ask me if they lose track of which arc you are and how to get a hold of you. They can always <laughs> ask me that. And um, I don't have any other questions at this time. So thank Good. you very much for presenting tonight. And You're did welcome. you mention that it's recorded it's and it's going to go on your, yep. on your, it'll be on our website. It'll be sent out to everyone that RSVP as well. And you may share it with other people. Um, remember we serve the entire state of Virginia. So inevitably after the fact, I'm going to get an email that says, do you serve Richmond and Henrico County as well? You're the Ark in Northern Virginia. We do. <laughs> we do the entire state as well. It was Maryland and DC. So you're welcome, Jonathan. And thank you, everybody. Um, that's that's me. And then Allie is the young lady who uh, manages my calendar at this time. We're going to be switching to Calendly or whatever it's really called so that you'll also be able to um, schedule through that. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate you joining. I'm glad that people have learned something. I know it's a lot of information, so feel free to attend the special trust presentation October, the third Friday in October and, and listen to it all again.